Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Missed everybody last week, but I joined those of you who joined last Tuesday with Doug's tour, Doug and Tim, and uh, enjoyed that. Looking forward to, to this and to next week. It's going to be fun talking about Prunus mume, one of the plants we have quite a collection of here, although they're not going to be quite as far along as I had thought they might be with the cold weather we're having, but they, they have started flowering. It will look good and I was walking by yesterday and could smell them even through my face mask as, as I walked by. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. Today we're going to talk about kind of little tiny plants for the, the garden. Now, as mentioned before we got started, I overshot with what I was going to talk about because I could do, you know, three or four talks about all the little tiny things in the garden. We really like those, whether that's things we grow in the rock garden, just in the open garden, whatever. There's so many fantastic little plants. I'm just going to touch on a few of them and then uh, hope that y'all can come out here sooner rather than later so that we can, you can actually see some of these things in the garden. Let's get in there and talk about some of these tiny treasures. I noticed one of the first people who was on the call was, was Bram Ray, and I was just pulling a picture of some gardens with these you know, dwarf conifers and other tiny plants. And uh, this is this is Graham's garden from Greensboro taken a few years back. You know, they're all these small things. And I love these little things that a lot of people do. You know, there are people who love, you know, miniature paintings, people who love, you know, uh, uh, miniature furniture, dollhouse type things. It, it seems to be we're always attracted to that kind of thing. And it's no different with plants. So I'm going to talk about some things that are normally much larger that are smaller, some things that are very tiny like this, you know, and things in between. But there is just this incredible world of plants like that out there. You know, what a, a lot of people, you know, think of is things like, like bonsai. And bonsai is not really miniature plants. Bonsai or, or penjing in, in China is really where you typically take full-size plants and make them small by pruning the tops, pruning the roots, really restricting their growth. Sometimes people will use miniature forms of these plants for bonsai or penjing, but it's traditionally you're using the regular species or full-size plants for these type of things, which can be odd. I was trying to find a picture. I know I've seen pictures of small bonsai of like apple trees or quince where they've got a full-size fruit hanging from this little tiny tree. And it's, it's a little, it looks a little strange. Whereas if you take a, a crab apple or something and bullseye it and you have little tiny fruit, it's a little bit more in scale. And, you know, and there are other things that are out there, you know, these little miniature type villages and things like that, that you'll sometimes see around. Train gardens are a big one as well. There's a lot of people who are very into outdoor trains. You sometimes see them at public gardens, but most, you know, good size areas will have a club of outdoor train enthusiasts. And so they're always looking for the little miniature trees and shrubs and things like that. that they can plant that'll be on the same scale as their miniature trains. I actually had a gardener at one point who had worked at Lego land for a long time. And she said all they did were miniature miniature plants and then hedges and shrubs between the different areas. Uh, they did a lot of shearing of plants and trimming little things and, and whatnot. I've never been to Lego land, so I have to take her take her word for it. But around here, a lot of times where it is 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 looking at these miniature kind of gardens. One type of garden with a lot of these miniatures that you get a lot of enthusiasts are people who like these dwarf and miniature conifers. And this is kind of our miniature conifer mound where we have a lot of these, these little guys, but also little cushion forming plants. You see some dwarf bulbs starting to flower. This was just taken a, an hour or two ago. So some little narcissus in there and things are starting to color up and, and start to show some signs of spring in there. You know, but it can be simple as little containers. Now, this is a whiskey barrel made into like a rock garden. And you see a, a little... Uh, Looks like some kind of a very tight little dianthus, maybe. Phlox uh, or dianthus over here, pulsatilla, little mints and, and things that are that are tucked in. You know, troughs, we usually offer some trough building workshops through the arboretum. Um, you know, traditionally these were hollowed out stones, but put little plants in there. And I'll get into the actual plants soon. 
but you know, little little conifers, little little um, mounding type type plants, little sacks of crabs. And a lot of these are these little plants that we use come from alpine areas. And I'm not really going to talk about those because those can be tricky for us. But if you get the right conditions, they can they can be a little. They, there's many of them that we can have success with. But in Europe and farther up north, they use these these troughs a lot to grow things like you know, that's that's. Edelweiss right there, the antipodium that's very difficult to grow except for in specialized conditions. And people are into this all over. This could be mistaken for a little nursery in somewhere like Switzerland or Denver, but this is actually Hokanui Alpines in New Zealand, where they've, they're have they growing a lot of these, not only New Zealand Alpines, but American ones from the Rockies and places like that in Europe, and Asia, and kind of mixing them all together. But we can do these here. We first installed some troughs on our rooftop. These were newly planted ones. And you can see little tiny perennials, little uh, conifers, um, with a little eucomus there, one of the, the small ones. And, you know, they, get, they just get more and more beautiful as they grow. Now, sometimes these plants will outgrow the trough or a small area, but, but they're nice little plants. You can dig it up and move it to somewhere else in the garden. Uh, Wave Hill, I love this, but they, they, they've just planted a bunch of troughs and, and containers and things all in one spot. That's a really beautiful display. Or integrated into the actual landscape where you're, you have troughs, you know, is this a trough? Is this just kind of a something set into the ground to build up soil? At one garden on a hillside where I work, we would take the granite curbing, you know, the old granite curbing, you can sometimes find this, you know, break your back if you try and move by yourself. And we would set them into a hillside, one this way and one kind of in at an angle. So it looked almost like a trough just coming out of the ground. Then you could fill it with really good, well-draining soil to grow these things in there. But you can see these different dwarf Alberta spruces here. These both look like some kind of upright junipers communist, but different ones, you know, but they mimic that. And, I mean, look at that. Isn't that a, just a gorgeous display? of these little tiny things that go up into full-size plants. I just think that's masterfully done. And you don't have to create really specialized habitats like a rock garden if you're doing this, you know, some of this in containers. You see a lot of sedums and, and little vines in there. And, you know, the nice thing about when you do grow them this way is, you know, people always want to touch these little guys and, and pet them, these little cushions and mounds. Um, people want to want to reach out and and pet those and poke them. But it doesn't have to be, you know, kind of creating a whole little landscape. It could be, you know, as simple as a little plant and a little pot. That's if you have a big garden, sometimes these miniature things can get lost unless you do something like this to, to keep them up uh, where they're viewable. And I do this. I always, you know, those of you who listen to a lot of my talks hear me say how I don't use containers. I do have a few containers, but I tend to do woody plants in my containers, and I'll grow them for a few years. So this is a little dwarf linden, a little leaf linden, Tilia cordata, that I grow just right by my front stoop. It's a little dwarf uh, linden. In 20 years, it'll grow to be maybe 12, 15 feet tall and half as wide with a nice little gumdrop head. In another year or two, I'll take it out of this pot and plant it somewhere in my garden. But for right now, I like it there. It's a perfect little tree. Now, we'll get bigger. One that's similar is one called just called Dwarf Weeper. And that's, that's the only name we have on it. And for a long time, I thought they were the same plant, but they're not. Hanakagane has actually a really big flower, really big linden flower, comparatively speaking. That's very fragrant. And Dwarf Weeper is very small, but this you can see, this is an old plant. We dug it and moved it out, moved it out of the last house back in 2012. It just kept going. It's probably 15 or 18 feet now. It's not really a weeper, but it kind of comes up and arches over a little very stiffly, but beautiful all year round. You can see this is this is late in the, the season, but I love it even during the winter. Real pretty plant. And some things are dwarf naturally. This is an Armenian oak, Quercus pontic. And at a fully mature plant is maybe 15 to 20 feet tall, but it's got these very stout stems and big buds on there. During the summer, it's kind of neat because it has full-size oak leaves on this little plant. 
but I actually like it even more during the winter when you can really see those stout branches. This is a plant that's been in the ground here at the Arboretum for quite a few years, and you know, it's still this small little guy. It's still kind of a, a little bit unusual because there's, there's, it's easy to identify as an oak when it's, when it's small, but I mean, when it's in leaf, but it kind of makes people scratch their heads why it's so small. And it shouldn't be surprising, um, there are actually a lot of small shrubby oaks. They tend to be oaks that grow in very dry conditions. You know, the West Coast has quite a few dwarf oaks, kind of our, our coastal plain has a lot of these little dwarf oaks that a lot of times people think are just wind stunted live oaks, but they're actually some different species that you get through there that are shrubby rather than tree-like. But I like this one because it looks like a little tree. I mean, this would be perfect in a little miniature garden because the trunk is really nice and stout. The stems are nice and stout. And so it doesn't look wispy like a little dwarf tree uh, sometimes does if you have it by uh, I don't know, a Lego building or uh, a train track or something like that. It would look like an old, old English oak or something. There are several dwarf flowering dogwoods. Pygmaea is, is just a really old form of a dwarf white flowered form of our native flowering dogwood. In 10 years, this is, this is maybe eight feet tall and wide. There are other ones, there's Swanee Squat, which is, tends to be shrubbier. There are some little more upright ones like Little Princess and some pink flowered ones as well. But you know, you get all the things you get out of a full size one including fall color and flowers and, and fruit. Now, the thing with some of these dwarf trees, though, is if you're looking at space in a small garden, when you first put this in, it's kind of upright, very contained. But if it gets wide, like these do, it actually takes up more garden space than a full-size specimen that is, you can limb up and is overhead because this is, you know, four or five feet high is going to be right there kind of in the middle at its widest point. So something to be aware of sometimes with these plants that get a little bit larger. You know, the Japanese maples, there are quite a few of them. I didn't put a whole bunch in there. Kind of the, the classic dwarf one, if you were going to go to a Japanese maple person and say, you know, dwarf Japanese maples, probably the first one they would come up with is Mikawa Yatsubusa. And, and you can look for Yatsubusa in the name. That often implies a dwarf Japanese maple. This is one called Koto Ito, Ito Komachi, which every time I've tried to look this up, I'm told that it translates to harp strings. You see these narrow lobes on the, the foliage, but it does not translate to, to harp springs, harp, harp springs, as far as I can tell, really. I think that's just an American name that's often put with this. But you can see you get this same great, brilliant fall color comes out kind of a, a real pale green and gets kind of a medium green over the summer. Every once in a while, you'll get kind of more typical Japanese maple leaves. If a whole branch starts doing that, you want to prune those out, but it is unusual to get a lot of different kind of uh, sizes of the lobes on the leaves. If you really want fine, look for, oh, is it like fairy hair? As the lobes are almost just strings. There's some neat things, but this is only, this only gets, you know, six or eight feet tall over the course of a decade or, or, or more. Other species do the same thing. And I mentioned that Yatsubusa, that always kind of implies that it's going to be a dwarf. This is a trident maple, Acer bergerina mino yatsubusa. It starts off life kind of as a shrubby plant, but if you, if you keep it to a single trunk, it can form this delicate little tree. This has kind of narrow lobes compared to the typical trident maple, but there are some other dwarf ones as well. Again, gets really nice fall color and the bark gets kind of quirky and ridged. Shows the age, which is, is very cool, I think. Uh, and it isn't restricted to those Asian maples. This is the vine maple, Acer circinatum, native to the West Coast. This one, little gem was found, I believe, in Vancouver at the at Stanley Park, the great public park in Vancouver, as a as a witch's broom, as a congested growth in a, a tree there. And you can see it makes just this little mound, great fall color. This picture with the fall color was taken on the West Coast. It never gets quite that good for us, but where Acer circinatum 
often struggles here on the East Coast. Little Jim actually grows very, very well. This is something I've noticed on quite a few plants that don't always do well here. When you get their dwarf forms, they do better. Many of the conifers, and I'll mention some conifers, that the full-size plant just doesn't really tolerate conditions here. The dwarf forms are often better growers for, the, for us. And, you know, there's different theories as to why, but I don't know that there's any proof for any of those theories. Now, this looks like a little dwarf conifer or something, but this is actually an elm. And on this part of a folio, there are several of these dwarf elms, Jacqueline Hillier, say you a few of them, but the smallest one is one called Hokkaido. And this can be allowed to grow like this, or you can limit up a little bit more to kind of creates a natural bonsai. That Armenium oak, the Quercus pontica, that has you know, full-size leaves that are six to eight inches long and three inches wide. This has little tiny, tiny leaves. So it's really very much in scale with the plant. And you'll often see people who love those dwarf conifers will often grow one or more of these dwarf elms with their, their dwarf conifers and, and sometimes dwarf Japanese maples as well. But they grow very, very well for us in containers or, or in the bread. In recent years, there's been some dwarf witch hazels that have come out. Some from Japan, like Hemimilis duponica, little Yamaguchi. This is one, our native spring witch hazel, Hemimilis vernalis with these very fragrant kind of coppery orange flowers called Quasimodo, came to, came to the U.S. From, from Europe. They often take our native plants and send back uh, new selections. This is one that I really like. The old leaves fall off of it so you get a good display. It starts usually kind of this time, late February, you'll really get, get the flower, get the flowering going. And then it just makes a nice little shrub and have mouth for analysis is a good plant for the shade garden. So it keeps it really nice and small. And you can grow it as a shrub or you could trim it up and grow it as a small tree as well, which is actually how I like it is as a kind of a miniature tree. Dwarf crepe myrtles, there has been just an explosion of kind of, you know, pick your size for your crepe myrtle. Do you want it to be 25 feet tall? Do you want it to be 18 feet tall? Do you want it to be 12 feet tall? six feet tall, four feet tall, you know, two feet tall. You can kind of pick whatever you want. And there's been just, just a gajillion of them that have come out. And it's funny because one of the old, very, very oldest, earliest little dwarf crepe myrtles is this Pokemon. And it makes a little shrub covered in really nice colored pink flowers, got small leaves, gets okay fall color. I still think this is the very best. I like this more than any of the new selections that have come out. I like the form. I like the leaf size. I like the shape, the flowering. I, you know, some of them have great big flower clusters that seem out of scale on the plant, whereas everything about this plant really seems to stay in scale to me. Now, that's, you know, purely personal opinion, but I do really like Pokemon quite a bit. And you know, other shrubs get even smaller. This is Ikea, another of our natives, Shirley's Compact. And this, I have grown, a, had a plant of this for, I don't have it now, but I've grown it for easily a decade. And at a decade, it was maybe 24 inches across and 12, 15 inches tall. They make little green mound, get these little white, fragrant flowers on there that actually pollinators quite liked. And then in the fall would just become a most spectacular color, just like Ikea always does. But on these little plants, they'd be just like, you know, little uh, bonfires all through the garden with the little plant. You know, that's, that's this perfect little mound has never been trimmed or touched or anything like that. That's just how it's going to grow. Kind of really a neat little, little thing. Now, this one, the jury's still out for me. This is a newer one, and I put it in here because I love Viburnum carlisii, the, the Korean spice Viburnums. These have such fantastic fragrance in the spring. There's pink buds open to white flowers. If you have multiple Viburnum carlisii cultivars, you get bright red fruit. But this is a compact form, supposedly. It's still pretty new. 
And a lot of times the sizes on these plants, I don't think are accurate re reflections of what they actually do. This is supposed to grow four to five feet tall or wide, which Viburnum parlesii can become a, a quite big eight to 10 foot or more shrub. So we will see, but they've been fairly vigorous growers. So maybe not quite so small, certainly not, probably not tiny uh, as we were talking about, but you know, maybe, maybe smaller. Conifers. Now, if you like tiny plants, Conifers are the way to go. They are, there are so many of these little guys. This is our native white pine. I always love the, the big twisted needle one, Contorta. We've, we've got a, a big one by our, our visitor center here at the, the Ralston Arboretum. This is a dwarf one. I'm thinking in a, a 10 years, it's gonna get six to eight feet tall probably. So not a tiny, tiny one. I believe there's an even smaller one. For all y'all who name plants, there is no, why do we have to replace C's with K's? Tiny curls with a C is just fine. We don't have to do it with K. It just looks ridiculous. But these are, are, are very cool little plants, these dwarf ones. And you can get tiny ones. This is the Swiss mountain pine, Pinus uncinata. Very tough pine, very, very cold tolerant. But these dwarf ones seem to do well uh, in our, our climate with well-drained soil. This is one called Zelenac. And this has been the smallest one so far that I've seen that'll grow for us here. And it really does only put out, this is the new growth for the entire year last year was, you know, two inches or so. So if it keeps that up, like it's done the last couple of years, you know, you're, you're looking at 20 inches in a decade of growth. So this is going to stay a nice small plant. And there are just, there are scores and scores and scores of these small miniature conifers. Just keep in mind, whenever you're buying these miniature conifers, the sizes and the growth rates are always from like cold areas in Europe, cold areas in the U.S. And, you know, this one, they probably say it grows less than half an inch a year. Well, it's going to grow two or three inches a year for us. You know, something that they say only grows one to two inches a year is probably going to put on six or eight inches of growth a year. So the conifers especially get much larger for us in the southeast. Or they die. You know, the ones that don't like it here just turn up toes pretty quickly. But the ones that will grow, they will grow much faster. There's, there's, and over time, they can get large. Sukumu this is a Japanese cedar, a lot of little dwarf Japanese cedars. This is one of the very smallest. There are a few other ones, Tenzin and some others that stay very small. And this is another one that you only get a couple inches of growth on it every year. Here it is in a, in a little trough, but in the open garden, it's quite nice as well. And these little conifers and little evergreens are great for planting in, you know, with perennials, things, smaller perennials, because there's too many gardens that you see that just there's nothing there during the winter because they don't want to put, you know, big shrubs kind of towards the front of their, their borders and things. So some of these small guys can add some really nice winter structure. And I just hit on a few perennials. This is one of our, another one of our native plants, Silene caroliniana warii, short and sweet. This is one that really likes a well-drained soil in sunny uh, conditions but it, it's got these really lovely pink flowers over an extended period. This is only about four inches tall as opposed to three, to, three or more times that, that height of the, the typical species. Some of the creeping flocks can get quite big in terms of spread, but there are some that, are, that stay really nice and tight and compact. This is one I love, Amla. Been around for a long time, early spring, beautiful foliage. Uh, plant it on a bank so it has good drainage. It does just fine. And there are tons of those and tons of these dianthus as well that will make a little mound and just be covered with flowers. You know, there are other dianthus that will get quite a bit taller, but these little, these little mounding ones are, are adorable. Now, these are, this is an alpine plant. It wants perfect drainage. So you see it's growing in stone here as a crevice plant. So it doesn't rot out over our summer in the humidity. That's what humidity does for it. And if you were to plant something like this, just in ordinary garden soil, 
there's just so much moisture that sits in the soil that it, it doesn't like that. So if you're going to plant it in the garden, make sure it's well draining. And then even if it's just under that mound, put down some rock chips under there to keep it from kind of splashing dirt and things, splashing up the foliage, and it'll be much, much happier. But, you know, I'm showing these things from like alpine areas, but it's not just alpines. You know, you can have woodland perennials that do this as well. Diasporoxis, the evergreen Solomon seal, one of my favorite woodland plants. This is one, Jinfu Shanensis, from Jinfu Shan in China, that mountain. And this only grows about three inches tall, makes this mat of evergreen, glossy, glossy foliage. You see a little flower there. This is really past flowering, but the flowers kind of hang down under the leaves. So with other diasporopsis that are taller, you can see those flowers. These guys, you kind of got to get on your, your hands and knees to, to look at the flowers, but it's just this gorgeous woodland mat. And woodland rockeries can be really beautiful with these, you know, plants like this you have dwarf Japanese pieris, other woodland plants in these kind of gardens or small plants or containers. A lot of these woodland plants are used to root competition from woodlands areas. So um, they can tolerate drying out for a period often. So you can do them in containers in shady areas and they do quite well. And this is, you know, you could do this and it wouldn't miss a beat during the winter in a container. It would just stay evergreen for you. And then you might actually be able to see the flowers if it was you know, a little bit higher from the ground. And I'm not going to talk. I just mentioned that there are a lot of cacti. People use those and I don't grow cacti. That is not my thing, and so I'm not going to go deep in them, but there is a couple of them. This is a Mexican one from kind of Nuevo Leon area that grows outside. Little pink flowers, little cute thing, and this the kind of serious is uh, from Texas. It's sometimes called the Texas rainbow cactus, and this has, this one just keeps making mounds of, you know, puts out more and more of these, of these heads, and so as it grows, it gets more and more of those this kind of cereals kind of grow up in a column to about 12 or 14 inches tall and maybe four inches wide and then have big orange or yellow flowers on it typically. But they could make for, you know, neat little miniature landscapes in a container or whatever if you have some of these you know, more upright cactus that are, that are growing there, little desert fairy gardens, I guess. I'll finish up with some bulbs. I love dwarf daffodils. I love the miniature daffodils. I probably drive the horticulture staff here crazy because we always we will get a bunch of bulbs from Brent Heath. Brent and Becky's bulbs always late in the season, and I always come back with just a ton of dwarf daffodils because I just think they're adorable. So this is one of the classics. Tet -a -tet. That's you know the everything about it is about half the size or of the traditional, you know, the, the classic daffodil like Carlton or Spring Beauty or one of those. I, I really love those. This is New Baby. New Baby is a little closer to some of the species like Ferdinandsii. And so instead of having that flat foliage like you may typically think of with, with a daffodil, it's got almost like what you would think of from an onion or something. It's this round foliage. And to me, after the flowers go, these little clumps of foliage look much nicer than most bulbs do in the garden until they start disappearing. So the other thing with some of these like new baby and the species for Manzii and, and some of the other small ones is you'll get multiple flowers on what scape. So you can get you know, three, five, 10 flowers on some of these. But I think they make these beautiful clumps of flowers and foliage. So really like those a lot. And then the, the hoop and petticoat ones are another one, another group that I, I love. So these are only about four inches tall. They're one, this Swaro is, is uh, just the palest, palest yellow. There are ones that are pure white and ones that are, you know, nice and gold, but you can see where they get the petticoat type designation, these, these broad funnels rather than the, the more traditional form. But they're, they're nice, small things. And so, again, when you have those, you know, I love masses of daffodils, but if you have a mass of great big daffodils, you've got to leave that foliage up because that's what 
creates energy for bloom for next year. You know, the bulb gets bigger and bigger and they divide. And so you have to leave the foliage up, but God, the foliage can look so awful for such a long time on some of these that if it's, you know, a high, if it's an area where people are going to be, you almost shouldn't plant these big masses of, of big daffodils. You know, those are better for areas that you drive by and that's massive color that just smacks you in the face in the spring. And then after they finish flowering, you just kind of forget about them and the, they'll be just a nice green background. And then as they, as they start dying, you can cut them back. But I don't like that in my personal garden because it's, it's area that just doesn't look good. Now you can intersperse with some late emerging perennials, but anything that's going to, that's going to really hide all that foliage is going to shade that foliage and, and you don't want the foliage to be shaded out. So these little guys, you know, that foliage all disappears pretty quickly. Little bulbs that don't take as long to dip their energy. And so flower, by the time the, the, the real spring gardens go and that foliage is all gone anyway. You know, there are other things, you know, we, we tend to think of tulips as something that we can't grow very well here. And that's true for the, you know, the kind of the classic Dutch tulips, but some of the species and the ones that are closer to species actually will perennialize here and will come back year after year after year. This is one little princess. I just love that kind of coral orange with the, the yellow throat and the darker eye in there. If we have a very warm winter, they'll flower really close, just a couple inches from the ground. A colder winter, which is what they prefer, they'll get a little bit taller. And you can, you can see, you know, this is one bulb here. You get four tulip flowers on that one bulb over a period, because this is one that's, these two have been up for a while longer, and these are just um, opening up. So it does give you a little difference. And even you can see here, if you look under this flower, there's another bulb, another uh, flower that's going to open here. So quite a bit different from the classic tulips. Now, they do like fairly well-drained soil, but even more than that, after they finish flowering and the foliage is still up, they want an area that really bakes. They want to get as much sunlight as possible. Heat and sunlight are, are what really drives that foliage. But the, even the foliage, once the flower dies, is not too bad. It kind of lays on the ground and, you know, it's kind of a, a weird, funky shape. Another one that does, I find, does better than, than Little Princess in ordinary garden soils is, is Lilac Wonder. It's got this pale kind of pinkish lavender flower with this very distinct yellow eye. I just, I mean, that just doesn't look real to me out in the garden. Still a little flatter than the traditional tulip, still a little small guy, but still a, a neat thing. There are a lot of other little bulbs that are out there, cyclamen and, and crocus. I had planned to go out in the garden and get a bunch of crocus and other uh, little bulbs that are flowering now, but after all the rain, they were all kind of beat up. So I need kind of another flush of, of flowers uh, for them because I was going to bring them in to show. They just didn't look great right now, but crocus and different little dwarf scillas and, and different bulbs. Uh, can be can be really really beautiful. I I do some areas where I have cyclamen, lots of little bulbs. So they kind of the bulbs kind of come up through the cyclamen and and do that. And then sometimes some some really late emerging things like some of the syningias or simanias that don't emerge until you know, really until June or so. And so you can triple plant in these areas and things are emerging and you've got. You know, as the foliage for the syningias are dying down, the cyclamen foliage is coming up and it's flowering. And those are looking good and the flowers are finished and, you know, the bulbs are coming up through there and starting to flower in the early, very early spring. And by the time the cyclamen foliage is dying away, you know, you still got the bulb foliage and the, the syningias again. So it's kind of this, this cycle of plants all in the same, same spot. So I'm happy to answer questions. I want to mention again, the Winter Symposium, really hope to see you there. It's only $25 for members. And if you can't join us 
between 9 and 12 Eastern time on February 20th, registrants will get a link to the to see the talks that will be recorded and won't be out and available for non-registrants. do hope you'll think about that. Hope you'll consider joining if you're not a member. We do this because we really believe strongly in it. We want to keep connecting with everybody, almost 300 people uh, on us just today. But it does, while we're part of a university, we are a self-funded part of the university. So we've been doing this for the past 45 years and plan to keep it on doing it for another 145 plus. But it really takes members to, to keep us keep us running. So I hope you'll consider joining. And whether you join us as a member or not, we also hope that you'll interact with us through all of our various social media and our website and go visit our YouTube. We've got millions of, not millions, we've got dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds of videos up already, but also by checking out our links and following us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, you'll find out a lot about what our upcoming programs are and a lot of great information and a lot of really beautiful pictures on there as well. So let me see if I can answer some questions. Well, there were some questions in the chat, and I'll get to them in just a moment, but I wanted to congratulate you for breaking the all-time record for midweek with Mark, which also <laughs> includes midweek with Bryce. We had upwards of 296 people at one time, so that was awesome. Okay, right. I, I had the first question highlighted, and now I lost it. They were looking for some advice on growing cyclamid. Cyclamid are generally pretty easy. The most common ones, cyclamin heterofolium, the ivy leaf cyclamin, and cyclamin tum are the most common ones. They're great. You can put them in open sunny spots in well-drained soil. You can put them in shadier spots, especially under deciduous trees, because they're really active during the winter, the cyclamin are. So you put them under evergreens, sometimes it's too dark. But if you put them under deciduous trees, they get that winter sunlight, they can do their thing. And then when they go dormant during the summer, the trees are sucking up that excess moisture. Where you have problems with them generally is if you're putting them in a really, really fertile, really nice moist soil that stays nice and moist all summer long or is heavy and retains moisture when it gets wet during the summer when they're dormant. You want them to be dry. So it's either a you know, plant them on a slope, plant them under or around plants that will suck up the excess moisture during the summer, or plant them in somewhere where it's very, very well drained. Great. And someone anonymous asked, what are the light requirements for the tulips? A full sun. They want lots of sun. Yeah, they, they do not want shade. Thank you for asking that. And uh, Brett was asking, okay. what about snowdrops? Snowdrops are fantastic. Snowdrops are fantastic. I am, I have always made fun of all those Brits and other folks who are galanthophiles who love their snowdrops. And I bought a whole bunch of snowdrops this past year. And I'm, oh my gosh, I'm becoming one of those people who's going out and looking at my little, little white flower thing with little green spots on the tips of the petals and going, oh, look, this green spot's different from this green spot. What is wrong with me? Um, <laughs> yeah, the snowdrops are fantastic. Uh, and they kind of, they're one of the ones that really kick off the, the bulb flowering season. Carolyn, Carolyn would like for you to talk just a little bit about rain lilies. Oh, gosh, rain lilies. Rain lilies are fantastic. And there are so many different so there's Zephyranthes. We have a native Zephyranthes, Zephyranthes atamasco, the atamasco lily. But the other rain lilies are mostly small bulbs, flowered during the summer, everything from white to pale yellow to pink and oranges, corals. And I mean, the color palette for the rain lilies is, is crazy this time, you know, nowadays. Now they're called rain lilies because most of them are native to dry areas. And when it rains, they all flower. Well, if you live somewhere like the East Coast, like we do, where we get moisture all season long, they will just bloom and bloom and keep coming in and out of bloom all, all season. Really beautiful thing. If you want kind of the, the, the easiest, easiest one is the white flower one, Zephyranthes candida. 
it's it's pure white flour. It's got dark foliage. It's, the foliage is really pretty on it. It makes these mats of kind of um, kind of this dark dark green, almost grassy but round foliage, and then will just be covered with white flowers um, over and over. But but there are so many of them out there, and they are really really easy. And since they're drought tolerant. What I do often, if I buy them, if you get the real choice color ones, colorful ones and things, you know, you might only get a, a few bulbs at a time. So what I'll do, you saw that picture of the, the little dwarf linden. I will take some of those bulbs that are drought tolerant. I'll plant them in a container with a tree like that and grow them for a year or two. They'll bulk up like that and I'll have more. And then I'll take them out of that container and I'll plant them somewhere else and put new ones in there. And Teresa would like to know if we grow any galanthus and aranthus. We do grow, we grow galanthus. Aranthus, I struggle with aranthus here. I grew it up in the mountains in Virginia, just fantastic. And I know people who do grow well. I think it's another one that wants, wants pretty good drainage. But I personally struggle with it. So if anybody here has really good luck, luck with aranthus, E-R-A-N-T-H-I-S, let me know and tell me what it is or put it in the chat what it is you do that makes you so successful with them. Well, I Probably remember, my prop, what's that? I was gonna say, I remember Frankie talking about that one. You really have to get the, um, I'm gonna call them bulbs for lack of what they actually are, extremely fresh. And yeah. snug them up that week and then you can move them. They're usually dried out by the time you get them and they they don't store well. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've never had, had good success with them. and. I always buy the real weird ones and spend, you know, way too much on them mm -hmm. and then they die. So. And Brenda's asked that she has a cultivar idea. Can she prune it down to be smaller? She can't remember the cultivar offhand. Yeah. I mean, so if you've got a large one, it's probably Henry's Garnet or Saturnalia. Those are the kind of the classic ones, maybe long spire. And yeah, you can, you can, you can't hurt it. You really can't. You can you can cut it back hard. Now, Ikea is is a suckering shrub. And so when you cut it back hard, it there is more chance that it will start suckering more. And if you don't want that, you have to be careful. But yeah, you can you can prune those back however you like. If you want it to flower, I would wait until I would if you're gonna cut it back hard, I would do it right after it flowers. Okay. And I, I missed this one, unfortunately. Winston would like for you to spell out the three plants that you mentioned that you can plant in um, a triple phase for flowering. Okay, that was cyclamen. Oh, some of my tulips. Uh, but it could be other early, it could be other early spring bulbs. It doesn't have to be tulips. And Samania, like little red. That's the one I, I actually have Samania. Make another in there. Semania or Syningia, sometimes it's, it goes by both names. So put that in the chat. Allison just asked, or asked just a little bit ago, uh, does Herbertia uh, Lehu or Lehu do mm -hmm. one around here? Yeah, yeah, that does. We distributed that a, a handful of years ago. Little blue flowers, it's a neat little plant, and that does that does do well. I haven't found it to be necessarily super long lived here, but it's real easy from seed. So if you collect seed every now and, and then. Betsy would like to know, is it a good, or when's a good time that she should divide her dwarf iris? All right. You need to know what dwarf iris she has. All right, now, if there are any people in the iris society on here, they can cover their ears because everybody I've ever met in the iris society tells me, you know, you divide them in the fall or very early spring before they flower. And then they don't flower for you. But the next year, they'll be amazing. I don't know why. I divide my iris, theoretically, when I get to it on time. I divide my iris immediately after they finish blooming, And then they flower for me again next year. I don't know a reasoning for for waiting on that. But no, I just do it right after they flower. You can do it anytime. It's not really going to hurt them. It's just you lose you lose the flowering if you do it at different at different times. But I'll say I'll also say this in the iris. I dug and divided a whole bucket of it a couple of weeks ago. And because that's when I got to it. Uh, so you know it's it's uh we, we, you know make hay while the sun shines, I guess. 
And Marilyn just asked what is needed to get Galanthus to do well. She hasn't been able to get them to thrive. They generally are pretty easy, I find. They want some, they want some sunshine when they're they're up and going. So deciduous shade or sun is is best. No, most bulbs don't want to be wet, so they don't love a really heavy soil. Sometimes if you've had bulbs and they've been doing well and they've stopped doing well, it may be because it's gotten too shady where you planted it or the bulbs, there's too much competition. But bulbs are storage organs. So if you had some and they've kind of dwindled away, you can often, if you dig around where they are, you can often find those bulbs. And if you move them out somewhere and divide them, they do great that way. I did see somebody mention great hyacinths. Great hyacinths are fantastic. The, the muscari are fantastic because the foliage comes up in the fall. And so what you should do if you're planting a lot of bulbs and you're one of those people who forgets where you planted bulbs, that you're out of sight, out of mind, every time you buy bulbs, get a bunch of, of grape hyacinths as well. And just plant some grape hyacinths wherever you planted your bulbs because the foliage will come up for the, the grape hyacinths and you'll rem remember that you have, you have other bulbs planted in that same spot. And that's all the questions that I saw, Mark, unless I missed one earlier or unless someone has a brand new one. I'm happy to answer more. Somebody, I'm just zipping through this. Somebody mentioned Tulipa clusiana. That is the single best tulip for perennializing in the Southeast. Tulipa clusiana, they will get better and better and better uh, every year, as opposed to most other tulips, which dwindle away for us. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd love to see some people who this is their first Zoom. Ha hope you, you continue to join us. I don't know what else. You know, consider joining us. Definitely consider following us. Come back for us next Wednesday at three. We're gonna have a really fun talk. It'll be me and, and Dennis Carey, our database coordinator, talking about Prunus Mume. And the Wednesday after that, definitely mark your calendars. It's how to prune hydrangeas. That question that everybody asks every year. So we're gonna we're gonna teach you how to do that and answer all your questions. Oh, I'm glad to hear somebody joined because they joined us for Gardening in the South. That was a great program, wasn't it? YouTube has a just a ton of information. Our YouTube channel, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, go back and look at our past offerings. There is really a wealth of information there. And, uh, oh, look, I wrote out, I wrote out Cyclum and Tulips and Semania and then didn't hit enter on there. So. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, Missouri, who's in Missouri, I bet they have that black loam that you can stick your arm in up to your shoulder. Hey, do I know when the ARB will reopen? I, I'm hoping soon. We've gone three days nationally with less than 100,000 cases. North Carolina's in good, good shape. Students didn't, haven't caused outbreaks here. So we are, we are hoping that it will not be long before we are open again. We, we hope to be open for spring for sure. Coconut, heart strength. Ah. Yeah, I get the Kamachi as, as the, like town beauty. That's where I could get from a Kamachi fan. A poet famed for her beauty. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, the, so Marilyn, I just posted it. It was a uh, cyclamen, any kind of spring tul spring bulb, but tulips are a good one. And then Samania, little red. And this time I'll hit enter. And Carolyn just asked about the plant buggy that resumes on the first Tuesday in March. Yes. And hey, Close keep an eye out. We, we did some, some cleaning in the nursery, and there's a chance that there will be some, some plants going outside that are larger than our typical plant buggy plants, but that will be going with that will be going for plant buggy prices. Star Bethlehem has a lawn bulb. <sighs> you know, it's yeah, it's okay. Here's Here's the, the worst thing. If you have other stuff in your lawn and you have the star Bethlehem, the ornithogam is, is a lawn bulb and you have to mow it, when you mow those things, they become like, like ice and you'll kill yourself walking on there right, at, right while you're mowing them. You'll be sliding around behind it like you're walking on ice. I have, I have um, definitely done that. Question about any plans for a big plant sale? Yes, we will have a big plant sale on 
the, in the last weekend in April. And that will be hopefully both pre-order online, but also in person. And <laughs> yes, our Bethlehem is a weed. Yes, I, I agree, but it can be a nice weed. The plant buggy, once we get into March, it'll be the first, it'll be the, it'll be out on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then once we're open, we try to keep the plant buggy stocked all the time when, when we're open. Any well, other like questions? That. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. It was great seeing you all, virtually or not. A lot of familiar faces and names on here, which I love to see. A lot of new plate faces and names, too. Well, Paul just asked about the summer symposium, Mark. Oh, yeah. The summer symposium, you know, that's going to be that's going to be a tough. We're going to make a decision on how we will have it. We'll make a decision on how we go forward at the end of the month, at the end of this month. And it will happen whether it's online or we shoot for in person will be the question. I think it will likely be online again, because I think by June, I still don't think we'll be putting large numbers of people from all over the country in a room together. I just, mm -hmm. you know, I think July, August, September probably is more realistic for that kind of thing. Um, the plant sale, the is plant sale for only for members. It's a good question. Typically, our you know when we're have our plant sale on site and we're open, it's open to everybody. But members get have a preview evening, and we always try and give our members first access. So, uh, with the online, uh, what we usually do and what I think we would do with this is we will open up the plant sale for our members first. And sometimes things sell out before the other folks can, can be there. You know, membership has its privileges, but we will open it up for, to everybody after that. So I encourage you to become a member if you really want plants. Say no matter what, it pays to be a member, right? Yes, yes, that's right. And lots of squirrels and some rabbits. Can you grow anything? Yes, you can grow lots of stuff. Some of it they don't eat. We've got a great program coming up when, Chris? That's about and, end of the month. I forget the date. I'm pulling it up right now. End of the month. Wait, I'm going to tell you right now. No, I'm not. It's on um, Saturday, but we have February 27th, keeping the animals out. Okay. Oh, uh, that's, a, that's when you do need to register for, I believe. Yes, and that one's with Bree Arthur. It's uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. Will do. So yeah, make sure you register for that one. Yeah, groundhogs. <laughs> My brother has those. <laughs> yeah, I planted a ton of bulbs this spring, and man, the squirrels got them. They got them. They got them bad. They got them bad. Moles, moles too. Yeah. Sounds like your puppy is saying that it's time for the lecture to be over. Yeah, the puppy is. Let's let's let's. Let's get him on video. Hold on. Let me get my, rid of my background so you can see him. Oh, precious. There you go. That's Gus right there. He's so cute. Yes. Oh, I love the ears and the eyebrows. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And he what has. Kind, what kind of dog? He is a Bernadoodle. So half Bernie's mountain dog, half toy poodle so he is about 40 pounds oh, fully grown so that's the strangest combination i've ever heard <laughs> yeah don't think too hard about it <laughs> we no. we uh but, but yes he's a he's a sweet puppy he's beautiful he get hmm? this is it he's, get? Yeah, this is it 40 pounds or so is the biggest he'll get so he is fully that's grown no hmm. nah, yeah. not bad at all He's good. He's, cool. he's kind of the baby of the family. The the two we got two old ladies in the in the house, and they're not so sure much about about this one year old here. <laughs> not giving them a new my, my wife. Yeah, my wife's been out of town somewhere for about the past month, so this the dog's been a little bit. This is her dog. He's he's uh, been a little out of sorts. So, and my daughter's working from home. So I brought him in today so she wouldn't have to deal with him whining. He's beautiful. Oh, wow. The number one most popular breed right now. That is crazy. 
Oh, let me show you these. These are the rain lilies I got. Oh for, yeah. For five bucks. At, you know, I think it was Home Depot. Yeah. 15 bulbs. That's I, pretty I good. Wasn't, I wasn't sure what to expect. Yeah, you know, those package bulbs are a mixed lot. Sometimes you get really good stuff. Sometimes it, you get them and nothing comes up at all. The ones that, that kill me, sometimes you see Aranthus, which they won't come up if you get those from Home Depot. And uh, also some of the Anemone Blandas, those can be really tough uh, as well. Sometimes you can salvage those if you soak them for about 24 hours before you plant them. But, you think uh, I should try that on lilies, this? No, I wouldn't Open do that them? with the rain levels. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The, the more they can dry out, the <laughs> worse they do. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, Good. Thank you. Excellent. Enjoyed it. Thank y'all. Thank y'all for Thank coming. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, everyone. Well, we'll see you. We get three for the Prunus Mume talk. Yeah, it's going to be Hi, fun. Dean. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> uh, All right. Dennis doesn't know he's getting Thanks, himself Chris. into. Bye, everyone. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye, Linda. Thank you. Bye, Bye Chris. See you, Paul. See you, Linda. Sally, Bye -bye. everybody. Bye.